and how do we get there? Our first speaker covering China's climate dilemma is David Roland Holst from the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics. Please welcome David to the stand. Thank you very much, Paul. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for, bring, uh, for coming and bringing your, uh, your attention and interest to these important uh, issues. I'm going to speak from a slightly different perspective than the discussion this morning. What I'd like to do here is to give you a perspective of the implications of some of these issues for a major emerging economy, because as we know, the legacy of economic growth since we first domesticated carbon fuels in the Industrial Revolution has led to a very diverse uh, development and growth experiences. And uh, the most prominent uh, player in the, in the global emissions game today, uh, China, has, uh, is in a very different uh, position. So I want to try to give you a sense of perspective there, because as we all know, China was a very uh, decisive player in Copenhagen. And I'm, first of all, let's just talk about what uh, happened from this perspective. Uh, I wouldn't call myself uh, an advocate or, uh, or a critic of uh, any individual country in this process, but China was singled out by many observers after uh, the meetings as uh, being less than constructive in the process. And here are some of the major issues, I think, uh, that encapsulate uh, China's situation. First of all, its position was seriously complicated by a perceived conflict that is a domestic perception, very strong domestic perception in China, that uh, there is a, a trade-off between growth and environmental objectives. Of course, this is all very familiar to us. We hear this constantly in the American political dialogue. So it's not at all surprising that uh, in China there would be similar um, polarized views about uh, the trade-off between, uh, between environment and growth. Uh, because the former objective, that is growth, is paramount to the Chinese leadership, uh, the latter is being relegated to longer-term action. And this is within the decision-making apparatus. As you're probably aware, uh, over the last generation, the legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party has shifted 180 degrees from ideology to economic growth. I think we all understand that the primary source of uh, popular legitimacy uh, in China, of this, of this centralized authoritarian government uh, derives from the, its capacity to improve material living standards. So growth is the objective. And to give you some uh, sense of the scale of this challenge for the Chinese government, quite apart from recession, which they have largely overcome at the moment in China, uh, China needs to generate between 30 and 40 million new jobs per year in order to maintain what we call full employment. And as you know, last night our president was talking about a very significant hurdle of 7 million jobs and uh, legislation dedicated to trying to overcome the jobs gap that was created by the recession. Uh, China's employment challenge far exceeds anything that the U.S. has experienced since the Great Depression. And this is why the issue of growth is a profoundly important political priority for the Chinese government. And uh, without making any... Uh, sort of moral judgments about uh, green, et cetera, et cetera. This is really a fundamental thing we need to recognize about uh, the Chinese political agenda. And meanwhile, China was experimenting with its role as a first-tier global economic and political power in this venue. Uh, China is relatively new to these venues in this role, and it was clear from their behavior uh, in the negotiating process that they were experimenting with bargaining strategies that had the effect, apparently, of undermining uh, the momentum of agreement and cooperation. Now, there are lots of um, ex post analyses, uh, accusations of, quote, manipulating the developing country community and so on. We don't really need to go into those specific strategies, but it's very clear that China is asserting a certain, a newfound primacy, a newfound first tier status, and they're doing it very self consciously and deliberately uh, in most uh, multilateral venues. And some they're willing to sort of stand back and just let things continue, but there are other areas where they clearly are now ready to assert themselves. And they're doing it on what I would, I have to call an experimental basis because there isn't much precedent for this on either side. Let me try to give you some context now, uh, substantively. We don't have a lot of time today, so I'm going to go over these things very quickly. This is a slide that one of my grad students refers to as the demonic bubble bath. Uh, this is energy consumption per capita on the vertical axis for 114 countries. And on the horizontal axis, the uh, per capita income of countries. Okay, so uh, this is logarithmic because there's so much income inequality in the world, we have to use that scale uh, for per capita income. 
But you can see a very clear increasing relationship between energy use per capita and incomes. Energy is essential to prosperity. Let's all be honest about that. The source of energy is very important in terms of its climate implications, but energy and prosperity go hand in hand. We can't deny that looking around ourselves at the products of, of our industrial and later technology revolutions. And so the undisputed world champion of per capita energy consumption, I think you all know, is us, the United States. We're far out in front in terms of per capita energy use. And ironically, this isn't necessary really in terms of living standards because the rest of the OECD manages to do quite well at much lower energy intensities per capita. And in particular, one country, which has the last time I checked a very high standard of living, Japan, gets by with about half of the per capita energy use of the United States. So there's nothing inevitable about the intensity of U.S. consumption, but there is a very strong increasing relationship that we need to, to frankly acknowledge. That when we, when we address the concerns and objections about the growth environment trade-off, there may be an issue of growth energy trade-off, which is very substantial. The environment trade-off can be decoupled by the choice of energy sources and, and technologies, but we still have to acknowledge the energy and, and uh, livelihoods go hand in hand. Now, the ones we're really worried about for the future, of course, are these two big bubbles. The diameter of the bubble, by the way, is population. I should have mentioned that at the outset. But these are the two bubbles which make the bubble bath somewhat scary, right? Because those bubbles, if they were to rise even halfway to the U.S. levels, there wouldn't be enough energy, conventional energy, available. Uh, at least it exceeds all known reserves, the, the requirements for that. So, we need to come up with something if we're going to deal with this convergence. But I want you to see underlying this that the aspiration for higher living standards is a very substantial issue in terms of energy. We have to acknowledge it, I think, to be realistic. Now, what about China's policy obligations? I mean, what do we really mean by that? This is what's called the Lorenz curve, which shows the degree of inequality or equality around the world of some indicator. And the indicator we're using here is energy-related emissions, CO2 emissions. It turns out that the per capita distribution of emissions around the world is very, very unequal. Pure equality, meaning everybody used the same amount of, uh, emitted the same amount of CO2, would be along this line. This is the annual emissions rate from 2004 data. Very unequal. Highly concentrated in the high income countries. This blue line, even more interestingly, is the cumulative stock of emissions, which is much more unequal. And we know the story. We know the story about the legacy of the Industrial Revolution. We know about the fact that two-thirds of the stock of CO2 was laid down before 1950, when most developing countries were uh, abjectly poor. But this inequality raises a fundamental ethical issue. And I want to emphasize the ethical dimension of this problem. I don't, by the way, subscribe to the issues of legacy. I don't think that we could, it's meaningful to talk about reparations. Uh, I once heard a vice minister in China say at a microphone in fluent English, let me make sure I understand this. You want us to pay for the sins of your grandfathers. Have I got that right? <laughs> That's not an argument that I think is going to sustain uh, significant multilateral commitments, this sort of green reparations argument. But we do have to recognize that on a per capita basis, today's emissions are very unequally distributed. And that raises a fundamental equity issue. It really does. So China itself, because their per capita contributions to growth are small, believes that they have little moral responsibility to reduce their own emissions. They fundamentally believe that. And quite apart from the legacy question, today's emissions I'm talking about, much lower on a per capita basis. This is a fundamental ethical issue from the Chinese perspective. And it makes them much less likely to substitute away from something I'm going to talk about now, just to kind of scare you a little bit, and that is coal. Here's, a, here's an optical satellite photograph. It's a radar satellite that, that, that responds to particulates. And so particulates are these, gray, these gray areas, and it's, these are carbon particulates. So this is northern and eastern China, which is a plume of carbon particulates in this satellite photo. Uh, the same graduate student refers this as the Mordor slide. <laughs> you have this giant plume of carbon coming out of northern China. That plume migrates across the uh, P Pacific Ocean with the jet stream. There's some deposition up here, which I don't fully understand. I haven't talked to a meteorologist about that. But there, there's a very strong plume that goes across the Pacific. Most of it's deposited over the oceans. But it creates a negative externality for a couple of China's neighbors who are very conscious of it, especially the sulfur content of those emissions. Uh, here's the industrial area of uh, India around Mumbai. This is the industrial region of Russia. 
this is fire. Uh, this is fire smoke from the Amazon. What it does is, because of the Coriolis effect, it migrates this way. It goes up into the Andean Plateau by convection, and then it crosses with the jet stream, the southern jet stream, to Western Africa. It actually is improving soil fertility in West Africa, which is sort of an unintended uh, advantage, but uh, that's smoke. Okay? This is carbon smoke, and this is the issue for China. This is one reason why China has 15 times the U.S. rate of chronic respiratory illness, very serious public health problems. But uh, overcoming this is going to require finding a substitute for coal or technologies that don't yet exist um, economically to deal with coal. Here's what's happening with global CO2. As you know, China surpassed the United States in emissions recently, and it's headed uh, on current trends, it's headed uh, to go much higher. Uh, China could represent about a third of global CO2 emissions by 2030, while the U.S. is reducing it, and, and China is on a much, uh, India is on a much less carbon-intensive path. Here's uh, just a quick snapshot of the difference between 2000 and 2007 to get you a sense of the momentum of what's happening in China. China's uh, uh, emissions from coal have increased over seven years very substantially, while well, they remain essentially constant, shrunk in a little bit in the U.S., and growing a little bit in, in India. Where is it coming from? Mainly electric power sector. Over the last uh, 15 years, China has increased its electric power capacity sixfold. And over the next 15 years, it's going to triple that capacity. The red area that you see here is going to be added between 2005 and 2020. It will be 80, it's, that capacity exceeds the installed capacity of the entire European Union, EU25. And it doesn't exist yet. It will be 87% coal fired. And these are capital commitments which have a 30 to 50 year life. These are very, what we call lumpy investment decisions. It's very hard to reverse them or to scale them down. So this is the momentum of coal in China, something that we really need to think about. Is it necessary that things work out this way? No. And here's a great example from uh, the saint of energy efficiency, the patron saint of energy efficiency, Arthur Rosenberg. This is the... Rosenfeld. Uh, Arthur Rosenfeld, I'm sorry. Rosenfeld. This is uh, the Three Gorges Dam. Uh, capacity of the Three Gorges Dam. This is the energy savings that would result if air conditioners and refrigerators in China met Energy Star standards. This is a demand side solution which yields the same savings as the largest hydroelectric project in Asia, the, three, the notorious Three Gorges Dam. And the irony here is that most of the Energy Star refrigerators and air conditioners used in countries that have those standards are made in China. China only needs to adopt the standards of its, the appliances it's making for exports, a so-called export quality standard, and it could save energy almost equal in kilowatt hours. At government prices, they would save this much money. At retail prices, they would save this much money. So there are demand-side solutions to this problem. Why do we worry about it again? The momentum. And I'm going to give you one last pair of slides to show you another dimension to the momentum of this challenge. And just to give you a sense of what the negotiating environment is facing in terms of the discordant interests on various sides, especially the so-called G2, the U.S. And, and China. Here's what happens in economies where incomes grow from poor to middle. Uh, this is a distribution of income. These are milestones of consumption, consumer durables, television, scooter, automobile. Uh, at this income, median income level, which is about like China's now, some people can afford cars, not very much. The number of cars per capita in China is, anybody know? 18. The United States? 800. That would be a problem for the future of energy use. Okay? Cars per thousand of population. Per thousand, that's right. Cars per thousand. The United States is 800, Japan is 600, China is 18. That's okay. Okay? So that's a very small tail right now. But the thing to notice is that as this income grows, that's the horizontal axis, as we move along that axis in a linear fashion, let's say 7, 8%, like China does pretty fast, the number of people who can afford these goods grows exponentially. And so you have explosive growth of demand for consumer durables. And of course, that's wonderful for consumer durables manufacturers, but for climate and energy use, this could be an issue. And here's the, here's the chart for automobiles. The U.S. is up here. Japan, Korea, here. China is down here. And we're just getting started. That's a logarithmic curve. <laughs> So we have enormous challenges ahead in coal, in transport fuels, 
And you can expect to see the climate debate increasingly being informed by the disparities in these economic interests. We have to recognize it. We have to understand it. We need more experience in trying to devise cooperative solutions among very discordant interest groups, multinational. Until we do that, there will be deaf ears in the negotiating rooms. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Great. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's get some quick on-the-spot questions for, for David and then just uh, and then move to Michael. Any quick clarification before we keep moving down and then have a long discussion? Yes, madam in the back. There was a Chinese official recently in the United States that maybe seemed to allude that climate change was not related to the Great Depression. Do you think that's part of your initial point about your negotiating strategy, given that that undermines the... I did see that quotation. Uh, that he was basically uh, talking about a diversity of opinion. He was very careful in the wording. The wording was so carefully crafted that it was clearly uh, intended for the negotiating environment, I think. And that is, just sending a message that China is really going to be very deliberate about how they proceed. Okay. Not a threat, I don't think, so much as just a sense that we're not going to play by your rules. We're going to define the rules collaboratively. Otherwise, there won't be dialogue. One more quick clarification question. Yes, sir. Uh, on your slide, where you noted the, the standards for using the Yeah, speaking yeah, in yeah. Russian, we'll use the sure. microphone. Because we're being webcast. Start, start again, I'm sorry. I beg your pardon. Okay, so on this slide, I suppose there is a cost involved in making greener. Uh, household products. Is, is that correct? There's a cost in adopting these products, but ironically, these products are not only on the shelf, but China exports them to other countries. So, uh, but would it, the be, would it be more expensive for a, for a, for a Chinese to the buy The adoption it? cost is a, is a very significant issue, but of course the, uh, the Chinese government and even part, international partners could uh, provide incentives. We provide incentives for this. We, our utility companies provide incentives for this. But there just hasn't been the regulatory determination in China to begin implementing these, these policies. And it's unfortunate because many of these appliances are first-time acquisitions. They're not, they don't, they're not replacing other appliances. As you saw in the income distribution, many households are still to the left of uh, some fundamental durable goods. So this could be part of a new way, but it, we need the regulatory uh, determination to do that. Very good. Once again, another round of applause. For you. Another one of our star economists on campus is Michael Hanneman. Uh, he's also associated with the Goldman School across the road from here. Uh, it's with great personal pleasure I hand over to Michael for his comments now. Thank you. <coughs> well, uh, I uh, am delighted to uh, be here. I've enjoyed very much hearing the uh, uh, comments uh, by the other presenters so far, uh, uh, which I think were excellent. Uh, um, uh, let me uh, start off uh, 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 picking up uh, on a couple of points raised by uh, David. Um, the statistic is that in the world today, there's just under a billion automobiles. The, the stock of automobiles that exists is just under a billion automobiles. And the automobile was invented uh, whenever, a little over 100 years ago. <laughs> and it, it took uh, uh, over a century or so for the number of automobiles in the world to build up to a billion. By 2020, it's projected there'll be two billion automobiles in the world, with uh, you know, almost all of that growth coming in uh, China, India, Russia, uh, uh, and other countries. So in 10 years, the stock of uh, vehicles in the world will double. And as you know, the life of, um, uh, of an automobile is I don't know, 15 years in, in, in developing countries, maybe longer. I mean, not the original owner, but these things stick around and are used. Uh, and so uh, uh, even if the new uh, vehicles you know, are more fuel efficient on average than the existing ones, but that's a, an incredible increase in an incredible short period of time. Let me um, uh, step back. I, I should say I uh, was fortunate. Um, uh, at Copenhagen because um, I was uh, going to be part of the UC delegation uh, and when uh, I arrived just when they stopped allowing NGOs to attend at all and uh, I became fortunately part of the Spanish official delegation. I, I said I would use my best efforts to try and return California to the Spanish <laughs> Empire. And, and, 
And I pointed out that if, if that succeeded, we'd actually lower Spanish emissions per capita, uh, some, uh, some element. Um, so if you step back, there's two, um, there's two hurdles. The, the first hurdle is um, climate skepticism. This is uh, not being caused by human beings. Uh, you know, the sun is causing <laughs> it, or little green men from Mars, or whatever. And I think, uh, as a general statement, um, that uh, the climate skepticism uh, has been pushed aside in, in most quarters. That is, um, with certain exceptions, particularly in the United States, but, but uh, the IPCC report in 2007 sort of ended that. We face a second hurdle, which is the St. Augustine hurdle. Uh, as a young man, St. Augustine's hormones appear to have been uh, hyperactive, and he struggled as a young man between his lusts and his religious sensibility. And he famously uh, prayed to God that uh, God would uh, grant him chastity and continence, but just not yet. <laughs> and I think that's the essence of um, uh, the concerns with climate change. Most countries, most uh, decision makers, many industrialists and so on, recognize that uh, uh, burning fossil fuels is, is creating a problem. And at some point, this has got to change, uh, but just not yet. Either it's because we have a recession uh, going on right now, or we're trying to get economic growth and get a, uh, a standard of, of living up, or whatever, or we have this uh, coal-fired plant, or we have these uh, you know, workers in the mining industry, and so just not yet. Uh, but, and of course, the, the essence of the problem uh, I mean, St. Augustine then managed to get his lust under control, and he became a bishop and a saint, and, and he, but time was on his side, right? It didn't matter if he, um, you know, changed his ways within two years or, or within 20 years. And the point is time is not on our side, uh, and the just not yet strategy is, is uh, you know, seriously problematic. But that is the essence, I think, most... Uh, stakeholders, mo uh, you know, most emitters recognize there's a problem but want to sort of delay. Um, uh, a second observation, I, I want to just a second what um, David said uh, about China. I mean, my impression just from reading the newspapers was China was determined to scuttle the negotiations, that is, to make sure that nothing of real substance uh, was contained in an, any document that came out. <coughs> and uh, uh, it, it did this by, refu by refusing to agree to anything which had a, a, a specific number for 2020 or a specific number for 2050 or a specific mechanism for verifying or, or, or whatever. Uh, and uh, uh, my assessment of its motives, I, th I think, is the same as David's. Uh, China has a real interest in um, reducing uh, fossil fuel. Uh, uh, in the break, uh, Bob Collier uh, pointed this out. China has an immense problem with uh, energy vulnerability because uh, a very large fraction of its – it relies heavily on coal – a very large fraction of its coal is imported. Uh, and it's imported uh, across the Pacific, this is Bob's point, uh, where if the U.S. Navy wished to do so, it could uh, interrupt its supply line. Even domestically, most of the coal in China, and, as I understand, comes from the West, which is far away from the area where it's consumed. And in winter, with the snow and cold weather or whatever, the, the um, coal supply is disrupted. So China has a, a, a genuine and strong incentive uh, to reduce its dependence on, on coal. And it also has, uh, I think has been alluded to, an economic interest in um, uh, getting a lead in the, world, the future world market for green uh, technology. But um, like um, you know, many of the members of the Congress, many of the senators, it doesn't want to jeopardize its economic growth, and it faces the same dilemma between jobs and the environment that other countries do, but particularly the United States. And uh, the current position is, in that balance, it's not going to jeopardize the prospects of economic growth by committing to anything which might be viewed by political rivals of the current um, uh, people in power uh, as doing that. And hence, it doesn't want to commit to anything. And it was willing to throw its weight around. Uh, uh, another observation is this, I think, took 
the, the rest of the negotiators, uh, I mean the EU and the US, by surprise, and they were blindsided. And uh, John Zisman has, has pointed out that this was predictable, and in fact he predicted it in some writings this summer, but, but nevertheless it, it wasn't anticipated by the EU and the US, and they, uh, they didn't have any strategy for uh, offsetting this. Um, uh, another thing of the Chinese is they, um, they used uh, G77 and other countries as their front men and, and maybe manipulated them. Um, uh, and very simply, uh, unless something changes, uh, China has uh, you know, so much influence as a, as a, a major emitter that it's hard to see uh, any international uh, uh, body uh, uh, under the UNFCC uh, agreeing to anything more than, uh, 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 than came out of uh, Copenhagen. Um, in terms of developing a strategy for, for sort of offsetting uh, China's um, current stance, um, one element would be trying to peel away some countries like India, Brazil, and South Africa sort of a, away from China. And, and to the extent, and something happened on the last Friday that that's, uh, uh, when Obama sort of entered the room with those um, uh, four other parties, that, that, that is the direction in which things uh, things went and, and looking over time as uh, if China as China is now the world's largest emitter it will face a certain amount or could face a certain amount of international pressure you don't want anybody to agree to anything and you're the biggest emitter in the world right now and you know this doesn't look um, a very seemly uh, uh, position but it, it seems to me it will require um, a concerted um, diplomatic effort to, to try and separate other countries from China and, and, uh, um, and um, blunt its strategy if its strategy is to make sure that internationally in the UNFCC framework nothing uh, of substance uh, is agreed to. Now another element was mentioned by uh, John Seisman, uh, which I think is absolutely right. You need to break this into smaller pieces because uh, the, the larger point is getting uh, 170 or whatever it is countries to uh, agree is um, uh, a, a thankless task. In fact, the only way Kyoto worked was uh, a, a large number of those countries didn't have to agree uh, to anything in particular. And even some of the com countries that committed themselves you know, took a long time to coming through with their commitment, such as um, uh, uh, Russia, uh, such as Canada, uh, such as Australia, and such as Canada and the United States, who, who still haven't committed themselves. So uh, John's point about breaking this down into s sort of s small elements diff uh, and elements that might involve subsets of the larger number of countries, I think is absolutely right. Let me, uh, uh, let me make a, a few remarks about domestic policy and then come back quickly to international. I, I agree wholeheartedly with John that the key is uh, uh, a transition in the uh, use of energy, uh, both to uh, a much higher level of energy efficiency and also to um, energy sources that are um, not fossil fuel based, uh, renewables and, and nuclear. Um, and uh, when one talks about uh, uh, policies, and I'm now talking uh, about domestic climate policies, um, what is striking to me is the qualitative difference between the problem of reducing greenhouse gases and the uh, problems of reducing air and water pollution, which we have wrestled with since the, uh, around 1970. Greenhouse gases are a much more difficult problem. And the fact that we had success in reducing air pollution and water pollution very significantly, unfortunately, isn't necessarily an indication that it will be uh, just as easy to achieve uh, anything like as a, a large an emission, you know, in anything like uh, two or three decades. Uh, specifically with, um, with air pollution, um, the heavy, the, of course, the uh, initial Clean Air Act was very important, but the 1990 uh, clean, uh, amendments to the Clean Air Act, which sort of ushered in the modern era, um, you can look at them as an example of the glass being half empty rather than being half full. Because that was legislation that was foiled for a decade. 
uh, I think there were over 100 unsuccessful attempts to introduce legislation in Congress in the 80s before uh, the um, amendments were passed uh, uh, in, in 1990. And by then, the uh, necessary technology of sort of scrubbers, uh, which had been uh, promoted in the 70s, was a very mature technology. And so by the time there was a willingness to act nationally in 1990, we had a solution which, uh, which was proven to work, which many uh, emitters used, um, and um, we had a, 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 um, a solution which looked as though it wasn't going to be excessively expensive for anybody, precisely because many people already ha had adopted this uh, technology. So there was a political readiness, um, which came only after essentially 10 years of unreadiness uh, and disagreement to take action. And uh, what happened, uh, I mean, the way we reduced emissions by um, uh, 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 more than half between uh, 1990 and 19, you know, the legislation, I mean, the uh, regulations went into effect in 1995. The way we reduced emissions by more than half between 1994, say, and 1999, um, uh, was very different from the challenge we face now. Um, most of the emissions reduction uh, came not from uh, scrubber technology, but from changing inputs from high to low sulfur coal, um, uh, and uh, from operating the existing uh, scrubbers at a higher levels of efficiency than they'd been operated before. And, and that itself, uh, the improvements in operations were an innovation, but not a, not a technology innovation, but just a, a learning by doing um, experience. Um, if you look at what played no role, energy conservation played uh, no role. Um, uh, there was, uh, a, I mean, the, you know, there were ongoing programs for energy conservation, but the empirical evidence is that it contributed nothing. Uh, price increases uh, in the price of electricity paid, played no role. Uh, prices fell. They fell because of um, improvements, for example. Uh, uh, um, they, they fell, for example, because of a decline in railroad costs. Uh, but even if you say, well, they wouldn't have declined as much because of the, uh, maybe um, the, the possible increase in uh, uh, electricity costs from, from the measures that were adopted is under half a percent in increase. So uh, there was no price signal, uh, there was no conservation, and there was no new technology. The scrubbers were a known technology. Burning low sulfur fuel was uh, required getting used to, but it was fundamentally the same technology as burning high sulfur fuel. And there was no abandonment of existing uh, power plants. I mean, some no doubt retired, but uh, we were able to use the existing capital stock and existing technologies. And the only people who, had, who were bent out of shape uh, at all were maybe 200 companies that owned maybe between them six or 700 power plants that... Um, uh, uh, had to shift in some way, mainly to low sulfur coal and in some case through, through adding scrubbers. And of all the 250 or however many million people were in, you know, were in the United States, uh, 200 companies essentially had to change and the rest of us went uh, through life unaffected. Now greenhouse gases are completely different. There is no low carbon coal yet. I mean, there's the prospect of CCS, but that doesn't exist on that scale anywhere in the world or, or maybe in one place. Um, there aren't uh, end-of-pipe treat. Uh, I mean, other than CCS, there, I mean, there aren't existing technologies uh, that, that exist yet, uh, either for end-of-pipe treatment. Um, and and, and uh, there are technologies for sort of burning coal more efficiently, those haven't changed very much. I mean, one of the striking things of the SO2 experiment is that it didn't promote uh, the use of uh, high-efficiency coal uh, in, in, in the construction of new power plants. So the, the thermal efficiency barely changed in the power plants that were built after 1995 versus uh, before that. So um, uh, the one area where we sort of have experience in technologies is energy efficiency. Uh, but that involves millions of decision makers, you know, firms, households, uh, the electric utilities themselves played a, a major role. None of those uh, uh, players was activated 
um, uh, in uh, the previous, uh, you know, with the SO2 trading. And the last point, and a crucial one, is the real problem with greenhouse gases is we have the wrong capital stock. We have, um, uh, uh, we have um, existing coal plants that are going to be very expensive to retrofit. I mean, it looks as though they'll be essentially as expensive as building new ones. Um, we have uh, all those uh, motor vehicles, uh, low energy efficiency motor vehicles. We have buildings which are uh, low energy efficiency. We have urban sprawl. This is a story about having the wrong capital stock. Um, and it's a story about requiring actions by millions of actors throughout the economy, not just uh, uh, you know, two or three hundred um, uh, entities. China, uh, India, other countries at least have the advantage that they're expanding their capital stock. And so they could, uh, uh, well, uh, I'm going to say something, this is an exaggeration, but they could sort of abandon their existing power plants and just instead of building two new power plants a week, build four new power plants a week, you know, or, or, or three. And, um, um, you know, three is more than two. But basically, uh, for them, if by 2020, most of the capital stock will, have been, will be new because it will be installed. And so, of course, there are higher costs with building a more efficient uh, it, maybe we're choosing one technology uh, rather than another. But they are replenishing their capital stock, and, and so they can do it. It's vastly more difficult for us or, or Western Europe um, to uh, deal with an existing uh, capital stock. So obviously, I'm not saying, for example, with buildings we can retrofit and we can do things, but it's a far more complex decision in terms of engaging decision makers. So t to pull this together... You could argue, uh, first of all, thinking domestically and looking at the, um, uh, the results of the Massachusetts election, that uh, if you, um, it, it, it would be nice if you could just regulate greenhouse gas emissions and uh, under the Clean Air Act, that, that is certainly possible. But otherwise, maybe what you need to do is try and persuade some more people that we can have a lower fossil fuel uh, footprint by raising energy efficiency. Uh, it has been done in California, uh, after all, and uh, in a way the big unanswered question is how, how uh, difficult and how slow would it be to uh, bring the energy use per capita in, in other states down to levels in, in, in California. Um, but, and it may well be, it, so the, the essential point is this, uh, and it's the point John made. Instead of framing this in terms of restricting greenhouse gas emissions, and, of course, there's a perfectly valid logical argument for doing that. It's better to frame this, uh, and, and this is not just a rhetorical point, but a substantive one. The real goal is to reduce uh, uh, our need for energy, and in particular reduce our need for fossil fuel energy, um, so that we have lower emissions, but we also save money because we don't need uh, as much of this input. And, and, and therefore... Instead of using a price just to price fossil fuels out of the market, we uh, fostered the adoption of, uh, technolo of technologies both in, in conservation and in fuel generation, which make it possible not to have these emissions. That is the key. That's how California has done it. That doesn't solve the problem 100 percent, but it's a major component. And the opposition in Congress to... Uh, 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 Waxman Markey or other legislation is fueled by the notion that it, the only way you can reduce emissions by 15% is to ramp production down and jobs down by 15%. And we have to, uh, the California's experience has been that you don't have to do that. Essentially, you can raise uh, energy efficiency. But in order to demonstrate, the, in order to persuade people that this can be done, the best thing is to go ahead and do it. Uh, which is part of the uh, green um, um, uh, 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 top uh, 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 program. Uh, and so it, it may be that not only the only thing that can be done, but the best thing that can be done by the U.S. government is to push ahead with, with whatever measures raise energy efficiency. Uh, moving just uh, uh, finally to the international step, it may be that to persuade China or other countries that actually they can uh, make progress is to demonstrate that there is an economic development path uh, which provides economic growth 
uh, but uh, without raising the energy footprint enormously. And I think until you can win hearts and minds, until you can convince decision makers, both in the United States and other countries, we're going to make very slow progress. Thank you. Let's do the same thing again. Let's take a couple of quick clarification questions before we uh, reserve the bigger philosophical ones to, to later. Sir. Uh, this is Peter. Let's see. Um, I was in Copenhagen, and I forget which U.S. negotiator made with Bob Stern, but they said we're not going to – before Hillary gave the 100 – before Hillary sorry, gave – Sorry, start the loop again. Sorry. All right. For, uh, James George with the Barbita. I was in Copenhagen. Uh, one of the U.S. negotiators may have been Todd Stern at a press conference, but I'm not sure – said – of our stimulus money, and this is before Hillary gave the 100 billion group mark, he said, we're not, this is not going to go to China. They don't, basically sort of to, to pry them away from the developing nations. Um, China, in their press conference, they objected. So it may be that uh, China's pulling back from a meaningful agreement may have been in response to this sort of a snub. I'm not sure. And additionally, uh, if you translate the U.S. proposal for a 17 percent cut based on 2005 levels into Chinese terms of intensity, if you assume a 2 percent growth rate for the United States, ours comes to about 37 percent, and theirs is 40 to 45 percent. So it may be that you know, they may not be taking our proposal seriously, you know, money and the emissions cuts. I don't know. I'd like to really know what happened with China. There's one guy who wrote the article. He said he was in the room. But any light you can shed on that, I appreciate it. No, I, uh, not having been in any of the important rooms, have uh, no more insight. But I would suspect that, first of all, you can have multiple motives and, and multiple feelings. But I would suspect at the end of the day, the key thing for China was that it didn't want to uh, take a, a, a binding commitment. And, um, and for reasons that I find sort of plausible, and for reasons that I'm concerned, will endure. Uh, uh, you know, maybe not for the next 20 years, but you know, for the next five years or, or 10 years. But uh, I have no uh, specific insight or proof. Uh, let's hand over to our chairman for a quick question. <laughs> you, you have oh, Reagan chairman's said right. I paid yeah, for yeah. this microphone. <laughs> uh, uh, Michael mentioned prices, and that was something that I was thinking about in terms of of David's uh, comments as well, uh, because if uh, what you're projecting about consumption of durable goods, uh, electricity and automobiles is right, uh, aren't we going to see a big spike in world energy costs, uh, particularly oil, um, in the relatively near future? And it, I, I think I would be concerned about that, if nothing else, if I were the Chinese uh, government, that that's going to unless they do something serious about energy efficiency or renewable sources, that that could really uh, throw a monkey wrench in their development plans. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, okay, let me just, uh, I'll come to the last slide, which I forgot to mention. Uh, which is, <laughs> he had this in the back. Which is uh, the sort of oil tsunami in China. Uh, China was a, was a small net exporter of oil only 15 years ago. Today it's the world's second largest importer of oil. And it's already rocking the tanker, if you want to put it that way, in terms of global energy markets. Uh, the Chinese administration are keenly aware of the liabilities, both on the coal side and uh, of this yeah, liability, both on the coal side and on the oil side. Uh, uh, Short-term considerations regarding the recession have taken precedence over all of that. But um, I think I'll go back to John Seisman's comments about defining the agenda. And I, I think in China you're going to see something very similar, where anything to do with emissions and uh, environment is going to be subordinated to energy security in terms of the rhetoric of these policies and the policies of technology adoption will focus on energy efficiency for the, uh, on a cost effectiveness basis and a competitiveness basis because that's very familiar to the Chinese entrepreneurial culture mm -hmm. and it will be much easier to mainstream that through the line ministries. Uh, without creating a new, quote, green agenda within China. There will be a very strong, but there will be a very strong impetus from energy markets. As you probably know, the IEA has repudiated its own forecasts this year of global energy prices. They're uh, ramping up their expectations about energy prices, and energy prices are looking to come back with a vengeance. So. And just, it was significant yesterday that the Chinese <coughs> government uh, formed, uh, made the prime minister, the, created an energy ministry yes, yeah. that would uh, override all the other ministries mm -hmm. and put the I prime see. minister in charge of it. Good. As we're moving along, I would like to um, move 
lastly to our uh, distinguished uh, economist Larry Carp for comments, and then following Larry's comments, we'll have some uh, general discussion. Larry, thank you very much for being with us today. Thanks. Sit sitting in Berkeley uh, watching what was going on in Copenhagen was a bit like watching a train wreck in, in slow motion. You, you know where it's going, but you hope that uh, there will be a deus ex machina who steps in to, uh, to change the storyline. And of course, in the event, uh, neither Obama nor our own governor were big, big enough deuses to, uh, to, to change the plot. I, I think one of the one of the uh, one of the themes of this conference, I guess, is uh, what has changed as a consequence of, of uh, Copenhagen, and I think that the the short answer to that is not much has changed because not much happened in Copenhagen. Uh, I, I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about some things that perhaps have changed as a consequence of Copenhagen, and then then return to or, or then move on to some some views that I held before Copenhagen. And which I which I think are still still substantially correct. Well, one, one thing that uh, the, one thing that may have changed a, a bit as a consequence of Copenhagen has already been discussed today on, on a number of occasions. I think that the the arguments uh, in favor of changing the uh, the venue for uh, for these climate negotiations uh, that that argument has has become more compelling. Uh, since that issue has been pretty extensively talked about, I won't say anything more about it. There, there's another uh, somewhat related point, and that is that for, for a number of years there, uh, there, there have been uh, suggestions that we should, we should uh, try to hive off parts of the problem of climate change and focus on, on, on smaller but nevertheless significant problems. And one of the, uh, one of the probably the most... Uh, uh, likely candidates for this uh, c concerns uh, what's known, what are known as industrial gases or, or the, the CFCs. These have been reduced uh, under the uh, clean development mechanism, but, but that reduction has been very expensive. And uh, it's been suggested that there could be a, a, a very narrowly focused agreement, perhaps under the umbrella of the Montreal Protocol, uh, that, would, that would just target uh, these, these industrial gases. And of course, the basis for this, or the idea behind this, is that uh, that this is a, a focus problem. The sources of the gases are, are much less diffuse relative to the other greenhouse gases, and also it's pretty cheap to, to fix. Uh, now, contrary to, or the, the opposing arguments are that uh, uh, our politicians only have so much energy for environmental issues, and, and uh, asking them to think about uh, something. It, it, it separately may be a distraction. Uh, also, it might provide a, a kind of uh, fig leaf, an environmental fig leaf, behind which they could uh, disguise the, the embarrassing lack of uh, progress on, on, the, on the bigger issues. Um, and uh, th there's also, of course, the point that, uh, that, there's some, that at least in principle, there's some benefit to be had by linking fairly disparate issues because this provides the opportunities for making trade-off. And to the extent that you break these issues apart, uh, you, you, lose that, uh, uh, you lose that ability. So I think that the, the arguments in favor and against this sort of division of problems, the, the, the nature of the arguments has not changed, but the, the lack of success in, at Copenhagen has perhaps given more weight to, uh, to, to the arguments in favor of, of making this sort of division. So, so now, so, but fundamentally, I don't think that much has changed uh, from, uh, as a consequence of Copenhagen. Now, I want to to talk about what I regard as the or what, what I, the views I held before Copenhagen, and, and which I I think are still correct. Well, it, it seemed apparent to me and, and, and many other people that, that China was not going to make uh, was not going to agree to quantitative uh, to, to limits on, on emissions. Uh, it's, it was obvious be going into, you know, well before Copenhagen that that was, that that was the case. And uh, to, to, you know, to think that the success of the agreement would hinge upon China making such, uh, s such a, 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 an agreement is, just was implausible. But of course, it, it is true that uh, it, it is true that without China's eventual and India's eventual involvement, uh, that, that, that we're just not going to be success in this endeavor. 
I, I think then that the that the problem is to uh, adopt some sort of uh, it's to some extent it's a face saving uh, 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 remedy. Uh, we will look for uh, quantitative targets in China and India in the future. We'll do what we can to facilitate voluntary reductions uh, in the interim period. But the the the, the basic uh, fact, I think, is that the that the big changes have to be made in the rich countries. And so we have to think about how, how we make those changes. Now, a number of, a number of speakers, I, 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 maybe not uh, qu quite so uh, clear, well, I think that they have at least implicitly uh, re recommended that the focus be on uh, promoting the development of technologies which will reduce uh, the, the abatement costs as distinct from promoting the uh, the, the imposition of limits on, on uh, carbon emissions. Well, th this problem is so big, we should do everything that we can to, to tackle it, and, and I'm certainly in favor of, of efforts to, to promote uh, the development of technology. But I think that it's uh, a, another fundamental fact that, that unless we agree on, on, uh, on limits uh, on emissions, then, then, we're, then we're not going to be successful. And part of the reason for that is, of course, that technology is endogenous. And unless we have a price, uh, a price of carbon, uh, we're, we're not going to create the right incentives for the development of technology, and we're not going to get a price of carbon unless we uh, agree to, to limits. Now, I think that the, the limits that, that, that we can practically agree to at this point are going to be very modest and certainly not, not uh, sufficient to, uh, to to remedy the, the the problem of climate change, but but still it's it's it, it's important to get started, and the way to get started is is to impose these limits. Now, in order to do this, I think we have to undermine the constituency of business interests that that fear uh, that there will be losers as a result of these, and we have to consolidate the constituency of business interests that think that they're going to be winners. And so, so we, we're, we're looking for a mechanism that achieves both of these goals. Uh, I believe that part of this mechanism has to, uh, has to involve international trade and carbon permits, which of course presumes that there are reduction, that there are limits on, on emissions. And the way that you, the way that you fold in these constituencies is by putting a price ceiling on, uh, on uh, a price ceiling on on carbon. This, uh, th this provides a guarantee that you can, a guarantee for people who are very concerned about high prices. You can say, well, it's not going to cost you more than, than that amount. Uh, that's a, a fairly obvious point, I think. A slightly more subtle point is that although uh, this, the, the price ceiling does provide some, uh, some insurance against high costs, it may actually be inimical to, to, in, to participation incentives, and the reason is because of some fairly subtle effects on, on the, the, the sub, subtle effects on the way these carbon ceiling, the prices of the carbon ceiling prices affect the, the identity of, of a country that's pivotal in, in an agreement. So without going into an, a, a detail, what I would like to see is what I'll call a, a high-powered price ceiling. And a high-powered a high price ceiling is one that recognizes that the price ceiling depends on the level of commitment and the level of cooperation, uh, the, the, the level of uh, uh, the, the number of countries that sign and the extent to which they're, they make binding commitments. So, a, 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 so this high-powered price ceiling uh, increases the price ceiling as the number of countries uh, as the number of countries increases, and the re and the reason that this promotes the incentives is because you don't get much from being a pre a free rider to an agreement that has a very low price ceiling. So what you'd like to do by, is by participating to increase the the price ceiling. Well, that's part of the story. Another part of the story is a price floor, and the price floor is important because it provides. Uh, it provides a, a guarantee, or at least a sort of guarantee, for uh, individuals and companies that are thinking about making investments uh, that, that will reduce their uh, reduce their their emissions. Now, it's easy to support a price ceiling. It's easy because the, uh, an author a world authority or the the collection of countries that negotiate this agreement they can just issue themselves more permits. If the if the actual carbon price approaches the ceiling, 
it's a little bit trickier to, uh, to enforce a price floor, but it can be done. And the way it can be done is by requiring that the, that the signatories, the OECD countries, that agree to this, uh, agree to these, to make these commitments, to require them to issue what are called put contracts or put options uh, to to an authority. And and a put option is just an, a, an option to sell a commodity at a particular price. Governments that agree to the, the agree to uh, the rich countries that, are, that that sign up to this agreement give to something that I'll call a carbon a carbon bank put options now. In, in, and, and the put options can be exercised at the, at the price floor. Now, so, so the reason that this works, or this works for a couple of reasons. One is the, the countries that, 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 that contribute these options incur no, finan no financial cost, providing that the actual carbon price remains above the price floor. And they, they, so, and, and this gives them a, this gives them, uh, it makes it cheap for them to agree to do this, and it also gives them an incentive to take steps in the future that, uh, that will maintain the price above the price floor. So, so I, 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 the, the main point I want to make here is that in contrast to some of the previous speakers, I think that it is essential that we have, uh, that we have emissions targets, and I think that we have to uh, we, we have to introduce them in, in somewhat subtle ways, and, and that involves a high-powered price ceiling and a price floor that's financed by, by these put options. Uh, I've got a few more minutes, I guess. I, I, no, the, the, the topic of, uh, of uh, trade restrictions has not, been, uh, has not been raised earlier in this, uh, in, in this meeting. Uh, most of the most of the uh, proposals in U.S. legislation have involved some kind of uh, some kind of border tax adjustment, some kind of trade restriction, uh, as a means of guarding against carbon leakage and and also guarding against the concern uh, that uh, that that the unilateral adoption of restrictions will cause uh, cause jobs and, and profits to, to flow to China and other developing countries. Economists have have, uh, have been a little bit have been rather skeptical of, of these measures, and un until recently, I think that uh, uh, the, the the general feeling amongst economists has been that, uh, that that they're likely to do more damage than good, uh, and the reason they're likely to do more damage is because they open the floodgates of what's sometimes called environmental protectionism, that is, a protectionism just hiding behind the the guise of of environmentalism. I believe that the view on this point is shifting amongst economists, and and personally, I, I think that uh, that there is a legitimate role for border tax adjustments. Uh, it's I, I believe that they should be they should be uh, adopt adopted in a in a very circumscribed manner. Uh, we do have to be careful about environmental protection, but I think that this is this is a point upon which. Uh, e economists should should uh, concede that there's a strong political argument, and possibly an economic argument. That's less clear, but but there's a very strong political argument, uh, and and uh, at least a plausible economic argument in favor of border tax adjustments, and and uh, I, I believe that they do have a they do have a role to play. In addition, these these border tax adjustments can be adopted unilaterally or more easily, they can be adopted by a, a collection of countries that adopt binding targets. Th this is not something that requires the uh, the agreement of developing countries, although of course their agreement would be would be desirable. I'm, I'm being a little. There, there. I'm sure there are people in the room who know more about WTO law than I do, but uh, and, and so I, I do recognize that there's that this is not a clear issue in WTO law, but, but, but I think that there's at least a, uh, um, a, at least a good case to be made for them. Uh, f I'll just make one final point. I, I believe that, uh, that, that it's important that going, he going ahead, we, we be really clear about the, uh, the importance of using market-based policies, by which I, in, in which I include uh, uh, cap and trade. And one of the reasons for this is, is that there's a uh, there, there's a there's a, a big coordination problem that arises when 
regulators are not able to make binding commitments about their future actions. So, for example, in the case of AB 32, we saw, we saw what appeared to be an almost binding commitment, but of course, even within AB 32, there was a clause that said, well, given, given certain contingencies, we can, we're, we're going to make changes. But, but now, as, as has been mentioned earlier, we see that there are efforts to, to completely undermine uh, AB 32. So my point here is that even though you say you're going to do something in the future, you can't make a 100% convincing case that you're going to do it. Everybody recognizes, or, or everybody who thinks about this carefully, recognizes that future policy is going to be contingent on events that, uh, that are information that, that is revealed in the future. In this circumstance, it's, it, 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 there, it really does matter whether businesses who are thinking about making investments, whether they believe that they're going, whether they believe there's going to be a market-based mechanism or whether they, they believe that there's going to be uh, a, a command and control mechanism. There's a sort of, there's a sort of uh, endogenous regulatory uncertainty that is far more pronounced in the case of the command and control policies compared to the market-based policies. Uh, I, I guess I'm probably at my 15 minutes limit, or so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll stop here. Very good. Uh, let, me do, let me do the following as we did with our other two speakers. Let's ask uh, just a couple of questions to Larry that are more on the lines of a clarification or update, and then we'll have a more open discussion in a second. Okay. So let me move, let me move along. Let, let me do the following. As I, as I look back on the session, I just want to summarize briefly by saying that David's slides are on, almost certainly on the website by now, and I think they were a rich compendium of uh, many of the key issues that especially face the world as the Chinese markets in, in coal and uh, energy production emerge. He did make some interesting points about the Japan uh, data, how a really sophisticated economy can create a, a well-developed economy without using as much energy. And I think that was then reflected in many of Michael's comments, where in, in both those comments, referring to work, say, by Arthur Rosenfeld, it's clear that energy efficiency is something that needs to be pressed in a very aggressive way, and we can do that in the U.S. through many of our legislative processes. The other element that struck me with, with Michael was that as China invests in new coal-fired plants, there is this opportunity, uh, especially around this 2020 time frame, to invest in, in plants that are much cleaner than the American stock, which all of our colleagues uh, you know, lament the fact that it's, a, it's an older stock, and once you've made an investment, it's hard to change it. Coming finally to Larry's comments, moving beyond those two uh, um, technology things, he says that you know, technology, for sure, technology for sure is very important, and of course uh, many in the engineering school are working on that, uh, but at the same time, there's a clear need for the carbon price, that we need limits. And as he was saying at the end, uh, having this high-powered prow price ceiling and this well-supported price floor are some of the key elements that we need to go forward. So as we're sort of wrapping up and, and going into a more uh, philosophical point of view, I think speaking for Dan Farber and myself, what we need to do to make this... Uh, meeting that we're delighted that you all came for have legs beyond the meeting. We, we would like together to work uh, through that website that you saw earlier, uh, perhaps to add a blog to it that all the participants in this room can add to, uh, to try and do the best we can to summarize some of the key points from today. Uh, but what's I think really key as we sit now all together in this particular building is that we have an obligation on the campus, as Graham Fleming and uh, Chris were saying, to try and bring uh, many issues together that we can now, I'm just going to take something that I wrote down while Chris was speaking. We have to reach out to our uh, colleagues in, in political arenas. Uh, we have to change some of the mechanisms of governance that will allow the uh, technology in places like Citrus and the economic wisdom in places like the Goldman School and ARE, we have to work together to get that into a uh, manageable digest 
so that we can dialogue with Sacramento, we can dialogue with uh, Washington, D.C., and of course we can dialogue perhaps in Mexico. So, Dan, I think, I think that's where we stand today. And maybe my three colleagues could sort of begin. Uh, I think the, the honorable thing to do is to give Larry the first shot since he uh, was last at uh, the beginning. And Larry, I mean, how can, how can we work together to do that? And do you think that uh, today's meeting has uh, brought out some key issues that we can work on, both from the politics, or I should say not both, from politics, economics, and technology? What, what would you say we could do as a, as, a, as a campus, and what are the key ways to bring those three things together? Well, it's, it's, it's certainly important that there be, uh, that, that the information about technologies be, be more widely diffused. I, I, I think that there's a, a lot of misunderstanding about what's possible now and what's, uh, what, what we're likely to see in the future. Uh, so I think that that's, that sort of educational role on the side of technology is, is very important. I, I think that there's a, there's a similar role on, on the side of policy and economics. Uh, and I, I guess there, there really is quite a bit of disagreement about the, uh, about the nature of the, of, of the policy that we should adopt in going forward. But at the very least, it's, uh, it's useful to, to have a, uh, a wider discussion so that we, that we have the opportunity to, to exchange views about the, uh, the, 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 the benefits and the costs of, of, uh, of different ways forward. And, and I think that the, the, the real, uh, I guess the, the, the most important distinction that I see amongst the speakers mm -hmm. today is, is between the, the role of, uh, the, the, the extent to which we can rely on technology and the extent to which we have to rely on, on, uh, on limits on emissions. Yeah, yeah. By the way, when I was giving my little monologue there, I forgot to mention the business community. Could you just add a... You, you mentioned well, a few things yourself as we went along. Actually, well, I, 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 I think Michael or somebody else has, has mentioned before that, that to at least to a considerable extent, uh, the, the the skepticism about climate change ha, has diminished. I mean, it's it's obviously not disappeared, but but I think that uh, that we're, that the reason that we're not the reason that we're doing so little is not because we are so skeptical about climate change. I think that the reason we're doing so little is because we're so afraid that it's going to be expensive, and it's just that it's it's such a mystery uh, about what's about what's going to happen. And so I so I believe that it it really is important to engage the uh, the the, the, di the different business communities mm -hmm. because we, we recognize that they're going to be winners and losers. From, from, from the sort of change that we're talking about. And we have to somehow reassure the potential losers that, uh, that their loss are, are bound, their, their potential losses are bounded. And we also have to, to reassure the, the potential winners that, that, there, that there's a very high possibility of, uh, of, 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 of benefits from, from investments and that the losses that they, that they face the, the losses that they face, which arise, of course, in the event that we that we end up not doing anything mm -hmm. about climate change, we want to put we want to bound those losses too. And of course, that's the purpose of the price floor. Okay. Michael, what would you what your sort of summary be of these? <coughs> Hard job, I know. But... Uh, in an international context, I mean, first I agree with Larry that uh, it's essential that there be an emissions constraint uh, and, and that there be a price on carbon and there will be no price without an emissions constraint. In the international context, however, uh, uh, countries have to agree to an emissions constraint. Right? Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, there's a problem. And what I, was, uh, what I was saying was if they don't agree, you, you can stamp your foot and say that's terrible. But the second thing is then to try to... Um, uh, demonstrate to them that, there's a, that there is a way for them to develop, be within a potential constraint and not suffer um, severe economic effects and that's, in, that's developing a strategy. And similarly, if uh, there are not the votes in Congress to limit our emissions, uh, we can stamp our feet and say that's terrible. Uh, but the alternative course is then to try and chart uh, a path, uh -huh. that, you know, convincing people uh, that this can be done at... Um, 
uh, a reasonable cost. And it's technology, but it's also behavior. And my point is behavior change isn't impossible, but it requires persuasion and it requires coordination, and it's a much more uh, complicated te so um, I, I think to the extent there's a lack of will both domestically and essentially internationally to make commitments, we have to look for a plan B. Um, and, and very concretely, there's the question, what will happen in Mexico in, in December? And why would you expect a, any a different outcome? Or rather, what can you do to bring about a different outcome? Because I've been suggesting, and this is my speculation, that it reflects um, a real... Um, uh, unwillingness to adopt commitments by China, but, uh, may, uh, but you know, by India and, 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 and some of the other countries. It's not just China. And so the $64,000 question is, well, what could uh, you get agreement to that would be meaningful? And how do you get from here in, in uh, January to there in December? Uh, and I think that this sort of road mapping in the short term um, is something that needs to be done, and I think the university community and, and the research community generally. Um, the last thing I'll say is, uh, having done a little bit of sort of mediation myself, um, the first point with mediation, uh, I mean, the crucial thing with mediation is it's not what I, Michael Hanneman, think would be a terrific solution because I'm not the decision maker. So you have to spend time talking to the decision makers and seeing what they feel. And, and this is multidimensional. I guess that has to be stressed. So it's, it's not just about the economic cost and employment. Uh, it's, there's um, a, a, the issue of sovereignty of taking regardless of, uh, even if there was no economic cost, I might not want to make a commitment to you. You know, no stinking commitments. Um, and then, uh, and a second, even if I'm willing to make a commitment, a crucial problem is fairness. Um, and if you think of emissions markets, the, the Achilles heel of emissions markets, the two Achilles heels, the left one and the right one, the left one is countries have to be willing to commit to limit their emissions. And the second is they have to agree to a particular emissions target. And no matter how excellent the price floor and the price ceiling, if I don't agree to the, no, the principle of a commitment or the specific emissions target, uh, this is not going to get off, uh, off the ground. And as I said, they're moral, there are many issues involved in this. And so in a mediation or negotiation, you, uh, you sort of have to try and you, you have to first see what are the, where they're coming from, and then you have to see if there's a way of, of uh, an argument of moving them forward. And I think that is in part something that uh, political scientists and sociologists and area specialists, uh, as well as economists and, and engineers uh, on campus and elsewhere could join in doing. So, David, you have the luxury of uh, <laughs> being I'll uh, be a little bit... Uh, uh, Spare because I actually have to uh, meet 200 undergraduates uh, who want to hear about China at 12:30. So I'll speak very briefly, and I'm not sure I may have to excuse myself from some of the questions. Basically, um, I, I agree with everything my colleagues have just said, and to that I would like to e either add or maybe elaborate a little bit on three points. I think that uh, for priorities that Berkeley can engage in, uh, we need firstly to recognize the fantastic complexity of this problem. And of course, as was said in the opening remarks, that poses a remarkable opportunity for an institution with such diverse and rich resources to support policy as Berkeley. We're not uniquely endowed, but certainly we are very powerfully endowed to, uh, to deal with, uh, with complex policy issues such as climate change. But I think the first priority is to strengthen the basis of evidence, the stuff that we do best. We do it individually. We do it in groups. But we really have a responsibility to try to improve evidence in all the dimensions of this problem. The early evidence was about the science of climate. The later evidence is about the needs for uh, the, the potential risks uh, and damage. Later evidence about emissions and its effects and technology development to respond to that. I think one of the highest priorities for research today is a research on institutions. This is obviously the next stage, the next challenge, is to develop institutions that can come to terms with this problem, because it's very clear, at least to me as an observer, that the established institutions, the Bretton Woods institutions, whatever you want to apply to this problem today, are not adequate to the task of addressing this issue. And my two other colleagues have talked uh, very eloquently about the limits uh, uh, in existing institutional designs. I think we need a lot more research on institutions to help policymakers see that 
potential for reorganizing the way we negotiate, whether it's unilateralism, minilateralism, multilateralism, I don't care. I think that uh, researchers can do a lot to improve our understanding of incentives and, uh, and uh, multilateral bargaining. Uh, the second area where I, I'd really like to see us, us as a community, make progress is in redefining the art of interdisciplinary collaboration. I think that we have an enormous opportunity in the climate challenge to deploy interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary research resources, but we've got to clearly come up with new ways of doing that, whether it break down the silos, tunnel through the silos, whatever we do around here. If we're really going to orchestrate our efforts effectively, we need new ways of doing that. I think CIPRIS provides a, a, a wonderful venue and opportunity to do those things. But again, I think it's a challenge to make that a reality. And finally, I'd like to see more parallel development of multilateral academic collaboration to support multilateral policy, partly because of the apparent dysfunction of the political institutions in their dialogue. I think it's even more important for researchers to reach out internationally, convene meetings, convene conferences, and strengthen the basis of understanding while the negotiators are squabbling with each other and playing their political games. We really need to make better evidence available on a multinational basis, the same mission, shedding light on these issues and building collaborative networks that are all providing information individually to their own national authorities, yeah. but in many cases, I'm sorry to say, have been co-opted by the political agendas within those countries. And I'd, I'd like to see us level that and basically reach out to our colleagues and expand networks to better understand uh, the entire climate uh, challenge. That was a fantastic wrap-up, colleagues. Thank you very much. I think we have five minutes now for questions before we begin to wrap up and allow uh, David to get to his class, for example. So. Um, First question over here. Uh, thank you. George Scharfenberger. I'm a, a special assistant in the Office of Vice Chancellor for Research for International Development. Uh, I think there's a, another alternative, uh, not to say that we shouldn't go on doing all the things you suggested, and that is, uh, I, I guess it was um, uh, John who had the analogy of a, a tall building and being asked for people to jump off without a, a way of getting down. Uh, I would say that a good deal of the world's population is not on that building, but they're on the, on, the, on the ground floor trying to get in. The waters are coming up and the building is falling down on them. Uh, I think that Berkeley has a tremendous opportunity to work with those people, uh, countries in Africa, Asia, Latin America, the smaller bubbles, if you would, uh, on the bubble <coughs> chart, uh, who I think are, are, are desperately open and, and need the kind of advice and, and guidance uh, that an institution, a public institution like Berkeley might have to offer. And I just want to say that uh, I'm currently working on a, such an initiative uh, to work with Ethiopia on its uh, adaptation strategies. Yeah. Could I just... Uh, sure. uh, adapt we haven't talked much to, uh, about uh, adaptation, adaptation, and that's an important component of the problem. It's also a focus of a lot of work in Berkeley sponsored by the California Energy Commission and focusing on adaptation. And, uh, California, just as AB32 was a landmark in, in terms of uh, uh, mitigation, uh, the efforts started at uh, the end of last year and that will continue this year represent a commitment by the state to have a state adaptation policy. But um, whereas you could argue that sort of mitigation is national and international, Impacts are local, and I, in my view, adaptation is local. And so you sort of need to do it bottom up. It's not the state of California, it's individual cities, uh, individual communities, cities, counties. And uh, the Bay Area, the nine counties, have just launched a, a major study uh, of the impacts of climate change, but also policy responses to climate change. And we'll be working with them this year in collaboration at Berkeley to, uh, uh, on the science, but on the policy element. And... Um, the, so adaptation is something where we can reach out to uh, other countries, and in particular developing countries, and learn from them as well as, well as take them. You know, all coastal communities face similar threats, and we uh, have uh, ourselves in the U.S. only begun to think about this, so we, we, we don't have, um, we're not way ahead of everybody else. But adaptation needs to be brought into the picture, and, and, and that's also true politically. Uh, because the only way you have a chance of persuading uh, a legislator to accept a binding commitment on emissions 
is if you uh, persuade the person that there is something at stake for him, for, for, for his country, that there are effects of, of, of climate change which are unpleasant, which is the reason we're doing this. It's not an academic principle that you know, uh, external economists should be. It's that uh, we are all at, at risk. And, uh, and, and since some level of uh, impacts uh, are going to occur anyway, because we're going to have, uh, if we had a two-degree um, uh, increase in global average temperature and no more than that, uh, by the end of the century, we would have a five degree Celsius increase in summertime in California, nine degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and that's, you know, the best case scenario where, where uh, Kyoto and everything is affected. So adaptation is a strong common interest uh, among countries uh, and also uh, uh, among researchers. And so that's an, uh, what George is saying is highly important. Michael, thank you. That was a new. Uh it was a subset of information. I'm glad Michael, Michael brought that up. Let's have one more general question before we break for lunch. And next to Dan here, I think we should. Hi, thank you. Christy Jordan from Alliance for Water Education. We're a nonprofit, and I'll be quick because I know you have to leave. Um, thank you for the invitation to ask uh, what can we do to prepare for Mexico City and COP16. I was um, at Copenhagen for two long weeks, except for the last two days when I did try to get um, uh, included in the Brazilian delegation, but I hadn't thought about trading California. So thank you. I'll keep that in mind next time. Um, so over the course of the two weeks, one thing that became very clear is the absence of water from the UNFCCC agenda and also how population dynamics is really a forbidden topic. So um, in preparation for Mexico City, the water community is somewhat tearing out our hair in terms of how to raise water on the agenda, although there were plenty of side sessions. Um, even Dr. Pachuri from the IPCC, you know, is discussing how water only talks to water. And I would like to put it out to the panel, how can we raise this within the agenda of the international dialogue? David, I'll speak that. briefly because I'm going to dash. Um, I, I'm sure that my colleagues can also contribute. Dan. But uh, I think that uh, water and uh, a couple of other issues, uh, uh, maybe of lesser significance generally, are being subordinated right now to a sequencing problem. And the sequencing problem is that the, the, the dialogue is proceeding mitigation first, adaptation second. And the, really, people's attention is being monopolized by the mitigation agenda, and that focuses attention on atmospheric uh, pollutants. So I don't want to, uh, I think water is extremely important in terms of consequences. In California, there are going to be very dramatic consequences in terms of infrastructure requirements to deal with wa seasonal variation in water. But uh, I think, in, in part, it's a, it's a problem of the focus of the negotiations being on mitigation first, and then adaptation essentially being subordinated to that. Let, let's, let's do the following. Uh, we do have a luncheon outside. And we'd like to um, invite everybody to join us. With the microphone, I wondered if we could give Professor Faber, Faber just a one-minute shot of saying thank you for coming. It's, it's the chairman of the conference, and I feel like he should say uh, farewell. Uh, well, thanks, Paul. Uh, I do thank everyone for coming. I think... Uh, uh, we have generated a lot of really uh, useful ideas for future directions on this campus and let alone ideas for the broader world. And uh, we're going to be meeting soon and talking about how we can continue this process. So thanks again, everyone, for being uh, here. Thank you for coming. And thanks to our wonderful panelists as well. That was really excellent. Thank you.